Good afternoon. Today's talk discusses the ideas and works of the architect and urban planner Otto Koenigsberger, who was exiled in India from 1939 to 1951. In India, Koenigsberger developed a sustainable approach to building that was rooted in the local, combining his modernist training with an interest in the social and cultural uses of space, as well as a commitment to experimenting with construction materials. Rachel Lee works at the interface of architectural and urban research, teaching, curating, and art practice. Her research explores the histories of colonial and post-colonial architecture and urbanism at their intersections with migration and exile, transnational practice, mobility, and gender. Welcome to KRVIA Encounters. So hi everyone, thank you very much for um, the invitation to be here this afternoon. It's a real pleasure for me to um, to be here and to give this talk on Königsberger. Um, yeah, as you can see, the title of the, the presentation is called Maximizing the Local, and that's more or less what it's going to be about. Um, but just to introduce myself a little bit and why I'm here at the moment, um, is because I'm working on a, a research project at the University of Munich, which is called MetroMod, Global Metropolises, Modern Art and Exile. And basically, it's looking at the connections between urbanism, art practice, um, and migration and exile in six different cities around the world. Um, and the, the, the sort of chronological focus is the modern period. So we're talking mostly between 1900 and 1950. So we're trying to construct narratives of modernism around migration and exile in these six cities. And as you can see, Bombay is one of the cities, and that's my city. So yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm here doing research for that project. And if you want to find out more about that, just Google MetroMod. We have a nice website, and there's quite a few articles on the blog, um, including one by me, which is about um, social spaces in the city, um, looking at places where people could meet and where associational activities could take place, where artists came and met each other, partied, where, <laughs> where, and where art was exhibited. And it seems that in the first part of the 20th century, hotels played a big role in Bombay in that respect. And so here you see the Taj and Green's Hotel, which was demolished in the 1960s, and where the Taj Tower now stands. So Green's Hotel is kind of an important meeting place in the city for cultural activities and social activities, which is what I'm looking at at the moment. But the subject of the talk today is Otto Königsberger, who practiced in India between 1939 and 1951, and was active in all sorts of ways in the architecture and urban planning realms. Um, yeah, and it's also interesting to see him in this context of what's happening at the moment. Um, I don't know if any of you went to this conclave, a conference that was held in Goa um, in August. It was called Modern Heritage, and it was over three, four days, and, and there was a lot of discussion about the architecture that was produced in India around the independence period, so slightly before, and then in the in the 50s and 60s. And Königsberg kind of is part of that scene. Um, so it's important to sort of see his work also in the context of Indian architecture that was being produced at the time and not seeing him as so much as a foreigner coming in with his ideas and, uh, and leaving again. Yeah, and just, it's also important, I think, to know that the architecture, Königsberg's architecture, but as well as the other architecture of that period, is now threatened. Um, the Hall of Nations, I'm sure you all know this project by Raj Reval and Mahendra Raj, which was built to celebrate 25 years of independence and was demolished in 2017, despite the, despite protests from around the world, from the Guggenheim, from the MoMA, from the, the Association of Architects, 
it wasn't just a local protest, it was also a, quite a global one. And yeah, but to no avail. So this, this architecture in this period is something that's, um, that's coming up more and more in discussions of architecture at the moment. So maybe it's interesting to think of it like that too. So this, this presentation, it draws on the work that I did for my PhD, which I did at the Technical University of Berlin. Um, and it involved quite a lot of archival research. So finding information about Königsberger was not the easiest. I came to, to India several times to do research and uh, also used various institutional and private archives um, in different places. His own archive was probably the biggest source, which is now at the Architectural Association in London. But at that time, it was still held by his widow, Renata, at her home in London. Yeah, and so I also visited the Tata archives. I visited the Karnataka State Archive. I visited um, an archive in Egypt, I, yeah. Sometimes virtually and uh, sometimes in person. And it was also important for this research to do field work, so as much as I could, I tried to get out and find the buildings that he had built, particularly in Bangalore, because that's where he built the most. Um, so <laughs> sometimes I had nothing to go on except an old black and white photo that I would show to people <laughs> in the hope that they would recognize what this is and where it might be. And amazingly enough, in the end, I pretty much found all of the buildings and a large extent to a large extent, they're still standing. Some have been demolished because of the metro construction. Lots of them have been repurposed. Many have been extended. But it is nice to see that they were so solidly constructed <laughs> that they're still, they're still being used. So as part of my, my um, research, I attempted to make a list of works because there wasn't one. Um, so I, I tried to document the buildings yeah, in terms of when they were designed, when they were completed, where they were, and um, map them that way. I also mapped them using Google Maps, so you could see where they were. Um, and the other part of the, the research was studying his network, so trying to understand how did this refugee architect who came from Nazi Germany to India how, how did he manage to get the commissions that he did? Because he became a pretty, pretty important figure um, in, in architecture and urban planning in India. Um, and so I'm thinking, how, how did he do this? What kind of people was he involved with? How did he, how did he construct these networks? What were his, his methods? So I also collected all of that information as far as I could, which is not easy. It means that you have to go through old correspondence and just whenever you find the name, note it down and then try and find out more about those people. Now you can see Minette de Silva is at the top of that list because she worked with him on the Jamshed for a development plan. And I used a software called um, Gephi to analyze these networks and see how the networks interacted with each other. I can show you the diagrams later in the presentation. But I'll begin at the beginning. So Otto Königsberger was born in 1908 in Berlin. His parents, Georg and Kate Königsberger, his father was an architect <laughs> with the local government and his mother stayed at home and looked after the family. He had four brothers and sisters. Despite his father's advice against it, Otto Königsberger wanted to become an architect too. His father was like, do not do this. <laughs> it's not a good idea. Go and be a lawyer or something. But no, Königsberger was quite determined to become an architect. And at that time, part of the training was that you had to work on building sites and work in different trades. So carpentry and, and masonry. And here he is apprenticing on a roof somewhere in Berlin. He studied architecture at the Technische Hochschule Berlin which is now the Technical University, where I did my doctorate. And he studied there from 1927 to 1931. And maybe it's also quite useful to think about what was happening in the architecture scene at that time in, in Germany and in the world. And another sort of 
seminal project of that period, the Weisenhof Siedlung in Stuttgart, was completed in 1927, which was the year that Königsberger began studying. So there's the Bauhaus, there's this where you have Corbusier, Oud, Behrens, all these iconic architects of the modern movement in Germany were all um, involved in, in, uh, in constructing this Weisenhof Siedlung. His teacher, Hans Polze, who also built a house in the Weizmann of Siedlow, um, was, was a bit different. He wasn't a sort of pedantic modernist. He was much more interested in taking his students um, and trying to find out what their own abilities were and what their own interests were in, in, um, in architecture and planning and trying to put them all on their own individual paths. And, um, he didn't want to have lots of little politics in his class, he wanted to have lots of individual architects in his class. So, yeah, he was quite an important figure in Königsberger's life. This is an example of one of his buildings. He built all sorts of buildings. He built lots of industrial buildings, municipal buildings, and yeah, office buildings. But this is a theatre in Berlin, which, uh, <laughs> which is quite impressive and uh, has been demolished. It was demolished, I think, in the 1980s, unfortunately. And when Königsberger was in Berlin studying architecture, he, he was also active in practice. You can see the, the image on the top left is the first building that he ever built, which was a summer house for friends on the island of Usedom in 1931. Um, it was the same time as he was doing his diploma project, which was a zoo. After, after graduating, and he ran, graduated with the bronze medal on the university as he was a good student, um, he, he entered the Schinkel Prize, which is like a German-wide architecture prize um, aimed at the students, and he, his entry for an Olympic village outside Berlin won the prize for architecture um, in 1933. Um, and at the same time, he was working in Berlin's municipality on a maternity hospital, so he was employed by the local government. It was a time in Germany where it was very difficult to get jobs as an architect because after, um, yeah, after the, this is the First World War, there was a boom, but then when, at the end of the 1920s, beginning of the 1930s, there was, there was a collapse in the economy and building projects were all the first things that were hit by this, so he was very lucky to get this job with the local government. He also um, was involved in town planning projects, like development plan for Berlin bedding, and he also built a small <laughs> country house near Berlin again for friends with a very flexible floor plan that allowed bedrooms to become dining rooms and uh, through moving partitions. So in 1933, Adolf Hitler seized power, and for Königsberger, this was a disaster for his whole family. His family on both sides was Jewish, not practicing, but still racially Jewish. And after three months of Hitler being in power, there was a, um, there was a decree passed that Jews could not work in the civil service. So he lost his job and he could no longer practice in Germany as an architect. His father had died couple of years before, so he was the breadwinner in the family, and obviously this was not just a crisis for Königsberg himself, but for the whole family with his four siblings. And he ended up going to Egypt and working as an archaeologist with Ludwig Borchardt, who was a, quite a well-known archaeologist who's known for bringing um, Nefertiti, the bust of Nefertiti, to Berlin, bringing it to Berlin. Um, and Königsberger was involved in surveying projects, um, looking at temples, and also looking after the archive and, the, and their library. Unfortunately, he became ill with tuberculosis during this period, and Ludwig Borchardt sent him to Davos in Switzerland to be treated for, for tuberculosis, and he spent two years there lying on his back, coughing um, and breathing the fresh mountain air on a balcony in this sanatorium. 
Um, he underwent a, a, an operation where they removed one of his ribs to collapse a part of his lung, which could have been, um, it was a dangerous operation. Um, and it also marked him as somebody that was a danger to public health. So if he had tried to leave Europe, as well, I mean, the, it was becoming increasingly um, obvious that there was going to be a war in Europe and this problem was not going to go away and that he was not going to be able to practice in Germany again in the near future and he was looking for ways to get out. And because he couldn't continue to work in Egypt because of this health problem, he was trying to find ways of getting um, somewhere else. And places like the US or the UK were out of the question after this operation because he had a huge <laughs> scar on his back which marked him as a tuberculosis, tuberculosis patient and a danger to public health. So he would not have passed any medical examinations to get into those countries. Um, during that time, he also wrote his PhD on the construction of the Egyptian door and uh, also earned a bit of money by working for his uncle, Max Born, making these um, flip book illustrations in the margins of a textbook called The Restless Universe. So you can see at this time he was not being able to do the work that he wanted to do at all. He was forced into doing other things. However, um, in 1939, he finally accepted an offer that had come from Mysore State to work in Mysore State as the chief architect um, and left Southampton for Colombo on that ship, the Gnais, no? And it's interesting, I think, when, when you read through the correspondence, um, what he notices about places. So the, his, this is his first impression of staying in Colombo in Ceylon in 1939. He's writing to his mother and he says, I have a large room from the ceiling of which hangs a large fan with four 70 centimeter long blades. <laughs> <laughs> the rooms are very high to allow the hot air to rise. The fan then pumps the hot air back down onto the unlucky resident below. This sounds very impractical, which it is, but without a fan, it would be absolutely impossible to sleep in this humid heat. So this is in the first paragraph of a, of a letter that he sends to his mother. You can see how he's already becoming interested in local ways of dealing with climate and space. I'm not sure how interested his mother would have been in this, but uh, anyway. So he, he was the chief architect of Mysore State from 1939 until 1948. I split this into two periods because the first period, um, he was, uh, yeah, his, his um, supervisor was the Devan um, Mirza Ismail, and then in 1941, Ismail uh, left. So this is the first period of his tenure there. And so I'm sure you all know where Mysore State is. Um, but yeah. It was one of the princely states, and lots of histories of Indian architecture or colonial architecture tend to look at British India and ignore that there were other parts of India that were self-governed to an extent. Um, so, there, yeah, it's interesting to look at these places too because it allows you to tell very different stories of, of, um, yeah, of modernism. And Mysore state was one of the most modern states in India at this time. There was an article in Life, in Life magazine, Mysore Indians help themselves. And it was also a very um, confident state, it had its own Swadeshi movement, and it was stamping Mysore on basically all the products that it made, Mysore soap, um, but Mysore sugar, Mysore coffee, Mysore, everything. And at that time, the two most important people that had in the formation of the state to that point were Vishveshwaraya, the engineer, and uh, Mirza Ismail. Both of them were Devans of the state, um, and they both set, they both followed this course of industrialization, education, development. But the buildings in Bangalore were not very modern. They, had, they were a mixture of styles, um, often with lots of ornamentation and domes and towers. And Königsberger, who had come from this sort of German modernist tradition, 
perhaps had a problem with this. Um, and just also to point out that although Königsberger was a European and Bangalore was a divided city, there was part that was ruled by the British and the part that was ruled by the local government. You can see like where his projects are in Bangalore, they're all basically, apart from one, I think, in the Indian part of the city. So he was working um, with the local <coughs> government and not with the, the British. So a bit about his projects in Bangalore um, from 1931 to 39 to 41. Um, these are very early ones. The bathing gap is a picture that I showed at the beginning with the field work which is now covered in advertising, it used to look like that, and the swimming pool in 1940. The university settlement was a project that was instigated um, by C.F. Andrews, I think, and the idea was that graduates from the local university would go and work and live in this place, which was next to a very poor area in the city, so next to an informal settlement um, and the idea was that the two communities would work together and uh, yeah, socialize as well. So they had things like an amphitheater, they had football fields, and the idea was kind of like an exchange between these communities. And it was all done on a voluntary basis with very little money. Yeah, and while he was in Bangalore, he began giving lectures on what he thought about architecture. Uh, I'm just going to read these quotations. So, first of all, he said, In the course of the last few years, it has become a criterion for a modern architect that he has tried to tackle each design with the same thoroughness with which a scholar in chemistry or physics takes up an experiment in his research work. The really modern architect is only he who takes the trouble, <laughs> and it involves a lot of work and trouble to apply to his profession the principles of scientific research. We in India are in the fortunate situation that other countries, even the USA, are not very, ahead, very far ahead of us if we start right now with a new scientific architecture. We must do our own investigations with reference to the particular climatic and social conditions of the country and the materials which are at our disposal. Everybody can and should collaborate by bringing each building to the maximum of efficiency that can be achieved under the particular conditions of Mysore. So you can see that he's trying to, for himself and for his own practice, but for Mysore state in general too, to develop a kind of scientific approach to building that would involve studying local materials as well as social conditions and climatic conditions. Yeah, he recommended establishing a Mysore Building Research Institute which would consist of an office, a few thermometers and cutting instruments, and the institute would be able to test the climatic responsiveness of materials and forms. He said, let us compare walls of granite with those of laterite, brick, or some new material. Compare full walls with those with holes inside, or study which is the ideal shape of a chimney head in the monsoon wind. The number of useful tasks in this line is infinite. So he said this in 1940, yeah, and this research station was never built, but in Roorkee, which was part of British-controlled India, a research institute of this nature was built, I think, in 1945. Um, he then went on to say, First, the needs of our present generation have to be studied very carefully. It, it is not so much the study of the needs of the Maharajas and other rich people, which will help us forward, but the study of the many millions in India who earn less than 100 rupees a month. Secondly, we will have to study the materials which are locally available, but we shall have to study and use them not in the manner of the craftsman, who has inherited a few thumb rules from his ancestors and applies materials in the way he thinks best on the spot while doing the work, we shall have to use our local materials with modern scientific methods, that is, after exactly testing their qualities in laboratories and drawing the maximum profit out of the minimum quantity of material. And finally, the third postulation is a careful study of the climatic requirements of India or Bangalore in particular. <laughs> so 
So this was how we approached building in Mysore State, and it was an approach that was very locally based. His idea was basically to study what was there and to make the most of it. He was trying to maximize the local. And he did it in various ways. You can see in the early projects as well that he's, he's, he's quite tentative about what he's doing. And over the years, he starts becoming a bit more exper experimental in the forms that he uses. Um, so here are some examples from Bangalore, the Serum Institute, um, which is part of the Veterinary Science Institute, looking mostly at cattle. Um, in Bangalore and the university settlement again you can see that he uses chachas basically everywhere um, and again here at the dispensary for women and children at the, and at the Bangalore city bus terminus chachas, ventilators and verandas so he's starting to use these local elements in his own work in a very simple, very geometric very careful way And he says about the chajas, the horizontal lines of the sajas, in varying levels, projecting in sharp corners, swinging round in curves, and throwing deep transparent shadows on the white walls, or appearing as sharp silhouettes against the beautiful sky of Bangalore, are just a few possibilities of expression to the artist, and sajas are only one of many typical features of this kind. Yeah, so he also saw the possibility of expression, architectural expression, in these local elements. And this was a lecture titled The Problem of a National Style in Indian Architecture, which was a question that architects were addressing in the 1940s, and seems to be a question that architects are still addressing now if we look at the, the conference in Goa. So he also used elements like jali screens in this Central College for Women in Nagpur, which was his first private commission. Um, and the principal bungalow of the Maharani College in Bangalore also has a veranda um, and it has the, the chajas. But the interesting thing about it is more with the constellation of the plan where he has the, the main body of the house here. Here's the larger pantry. And next to it is the servants' quarters. So it was an example of attaching the servants' quarters to the main building in a period where that didn't happen very often. Um, and in projects like <laughs> the Bangalore bus terminus and the Krishna Rao pavilion, Bangalore bus terminus has been demolished, but the Krishna Rao pavilion is still standing. You can see there's a kind of a conflict between this modern, simple, geometric architectural volumes and emphasis on horizontal lines with these towers and domes. So this conflict came from his work with Mirza Ismail, who was his supervisor, um, and who had his own very, very strong ideas about architecture, which Königsberger did not agree with. He says in the letter to his uncle, I'm still on good terms with Sir Mirza, who sends you his regards, but at the same time, I'm very glad not to have anything to do with him professionally. His taste in architectural questions is abominable, and his knowledge in town planning matters 50 years behind time. Both would be harmless if it was not for his unshakable <laughs> conviction that he is an expert in both. So, oops. <laughs> yeah. So this is a visualization using that software of Königsberger's networks in 1941. Um, and you can see here, like figures like Rosa Ismail, the figures that are standing alone, they have the most connections to other, to everything. So Königsberg is the biggest because he's obviously connected to absolutely everybody. But Rosa Ismail is also connected to many different groups that Königsberg is involved with, as well as a German architect who was, and, and uh, a foreign sculptorist who was active in Bangalore, was a whole legal match born with Königsberg as uncle as we discovered. And here is Holy Baba, who was Königsberger's best friend, basically in Bangalore. And a, an Austrian doctor who was also in exile, will go behind. So these people are the ones that are possibly the most important in his network. Okay. 
Okay, so the second phase of his career, you can see that he's starting to move north. And the yellow, um, the yellow markers are town planning projects. So during this period in Mysore, his, he was governed by um, Jaya Chamra Jendra Wodya with two different Devans who didn't have the same kind of impact on his work as the previous one. You can see also in this, this slide that the buildings are becoming bigger um, and yeah, perhaps a bit more expressive in their, in their design. At this point, he also began writing articles in, uh, here in a publication called My Sindhya on town planning and housing. He also was one of the founders of MARG, which was founded in 1946. He was one of the founding editors. Yeah, uh, these are some examples of the buildings from that time where you can see that these chajas that he was employing have become much more sculptural elements that they've developed curves and they're cantilevering in different ways in this uh, Institute of Indian Medicine, which is still standing, the Bhatia House, I have not been able to find. He also built at the Indian Institute of Science. He received several commissions from them. This was a dining hall auditorium. So it was a dining hall for the students, but it also had to function as an auditorium, so the, so the, which would support a single voice without a microphone. And it's a big building, so the acoustics had to be quite um, well engineered, which they were. And you can see here is that this chaja has become a kind of wraparound door marker also. Um, yeah, government offices which were not built. He also somewhat ironically <laughs> built the tuberculosis sanatorium. <laughs> Thankfully, he did not have to visit it, but uh, yeah. And also the metallurgy department at the Indian Institute of Science. You can see these verandas have become much more modern in their expression. They're, they're free from columns, they're cantilevered, they become sort of frames of the surrounding landscape. And social spaces too, so places where people can congregate and uh, meet. Again, the met metallurgy department, you could maybe see this window as kind of a development of the Jolly screen. Um, two more examples, the hunting lodge um, and the Bhatia house. Hunting Lodge was for the Maharaja. And in Bombay, hmm, he also was involved in projects such as the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, um, which was not built to his designs because it took a long time for the TIFR to be built. So by the time the foundation stone was laid at some point in the 1950s, Königsberg was no longer um, around to to build it, and the commission was completed by a Chicago office called Holabird and Root, with detailed design work by Kanvinda. Another one in Bombay was one of his was in fact his first town planning project in India, or urban planning <laughs> project, um, a layout for the workers' quarters for the Swadeshi mills, which he did for the Tatas through his connections with Homi Baba. He met the Tata family and then was commissioned to do several um, urban planning projects with them. For example, the Jamshedpur development plan from 1944 to 1945. Jamshedpur had already had several development plans. It was a planned city from the outset. Um, and Königsberger attempted to re- um, constitute what was already there by basically, in a, in a typical modernist approach, separating functions so industry should be strictly separated from the surrounding um, housing areas, which he split into neighborhood units, which was also quite a dominant um, planning form at the time. Yeah, and he developed a concept of elastic planning. So he was already starting to move away from the master plan realizing that it really wasn't that um, suited to the conditions in India where the urban society was growing so rapidly. So he says, any plan which wants to do away with the two de defects of insufficient housing and the mixture of houses and industries, and which wants to be a guide for the future development of recreation areas and traffic must be flexible. Nobody can predict that a town will grow to a certain size and not further nor is it easy to limit the development of a settlement if the economic need for its growth continues to exist. 
So he's starting to develop, to develop ideas that go against these traditional instruments like the master plan. Um, these are some details of housing that he developed for, the, um, for Jamshedpur as well as the neighborhoods. And the idea of the neighborhood unit was that it would um, be possible for anybody that lived in that neighborhood, any child could walk to school, and all the basic services would be covered as well in, within that neighborhood. So there would be a dispensary, a health dispensary, um, and uh, other things like that. The idea was that it was a walkable space so that women and children would be able to be everywhere in this neighborhood and not have to take public transport to get uh, places. <clears throat> And he says about the neighborhood unit, which is quite interesting, he says, theoretically, it would be desirable that each neighborhood unit in Jamshedpur should be composed of people of all social classes, highly paid officers, technicians, clerks, skilled workers, coolies and sweepers. However, I am convinced that such groupings, however good in theory, will not be practicable in present day India. Cultural differences and contrasts in the style of living are still too great for such an attempt. And that was him as a relatively progressive architect. So, However, his, his tone changed when he, when he was given the Bhubaneshwa master plan and the plan for Mithapur, which is only four years later. But independence has happened. And so these are post-independence projects. And you can see that, in, especially in the Bhubaneshwa master plan, he's developed this idea of the linear city where there is a, a government area, which is like number two on the plan, and it it's, has a central artery, and then two other arteries that um, are showing growth towards the north, and that the idea is that the city would extend towards the north, but always using these neighborhood units as the, as the blocks of development. Um, so it's a, basically the same idea as Jamshedpur, but he says, American planners have recently drawn attention to the danger of ghetto formation inherent in a neighborhood unit system which can be exploited by unscrupulous groups of vested interests. This danger can be eliminated entirely by correct planning. The layout of sites and the distribution of government owned and private houses must be such as to make each unit into a small scale cross section of the social strata of the whole population. So now he's arguing for mixed neighborhoods um, and not, <coughs> not the ghettos that he had used in Jamshedpur. Okay, so in 1948, there he is with the Public Works Department in Mysore State. This is when he was leaving because in 1948, he left and went to Delhi. Um, yeah, that's his network during that period. So, here again, you can see, because of the conditions of the Tatas and the kind of groups that Homi Baba was involved with, the Homi Baba has become really the central figure in this network. And the others, yeah, because that probably will match more, still important. Um, but yeah, the other ones, not so much. Yeah, I can't, I don't think you can read the names at all from that there. It's difficult for me to read them here. But this is a group of, um, Exiled architects and artists who are quite interesting in the project I'm working on at the moment. So, this is kind of a whole thing. Yeah. And his family is here, not so important anymore. So, this is the last period of his uh, career in India, and you can see that basically now he's working everywhere. And the, the town planning projects are, have taken over from the architectural ones. So in, in 1948, Nehru asked Königsberger to become the director of housing in the first independent Indian government. Um, and this commission came because of the Jamshedpur development plan, which was produced as a book. And that book was circulated within government circles and it had come to some people's attention. Um, also important in Königsberger being uh, given this position was the Austrian doctor who I mentioned earlier, who had 
left Bangalore and was then working in another princely state. And he recommended Königsberger to the Indian government as a town planner. Königsberger had already been working for the government um, and the planning commissions on other things. He was, he'd given um, advice on low-cost housing and this kind of thing. So he was already known, but these two things, Robert Hailey, the doctor, and the Jamshedpur National um, Development Plan, put him really in, uh, on the radar for the government in Delhi. And here you can also see um, more plans and buildings. Um, and as a director of housing, his main task, well, his, his, ta yeah, his main task was to house and plan for the refugees that were coming from Pakistan to India after partition. Um, and in Delhi, there were millions of people camping on pavements and in parks in Bombay too, um, but not to the same extent, I think. And so he had two approaches. One was an architectural one where he developed a low-cost housing solution that was um, prefabricated housing built here at this factory. And the idea was that, that all the material could be transported on a truck, taken to site, and then the refugees themselves would be able to build these houses. It didn't require any um, skills, really. It was just assembly of parts. Here you can see the prefab housing in New Delhi. Um, yeah. And the prefab housing used a system of aerated concrete for the walls, which he understood as a local material because he was taking the, um, all the um, parts for the concrete from the Jam River. Um, well, the, the process of aerating the concrete was um, imported, it was still produced there. Yeah, and it performed very well thermally, and it seemed like, and it was quite strong. It seemed to be the ideal material for, for this kind of housing, but the problem was that something was wrong with the mixture and the walls started cracking after they had been erected. And so people were moving into these houses and the houses were basically collapsing around their ears. So it was not the most successful project, and it took a very long time to get off the ground. And in the end, Königsberger left because of the failure of the housing factory. Um, there were a series of reports. The press um, got very much involved with this because it was taking such a long time. Um, so there was a scandal in the press. Um, the government was coming under pressure and somebody had to be found to as a scapegoat basically and Königsberger was that person and he was dismissed from government service. And I think the week after he was dismissed from government service they had found out what was wrong with the concrete and had rectified the, the mixture and they could then produce housing panels that did not crack but it was too late for Königsberger who was more or less already on his way back to Europe. Yeah, and it affected him very deeply, the failure of that project. Didn't come back to India for quite a long time. Um, but that was one part of this, um, solutions for the refugees. The other one was urban planning projects and the development of new towns um, in northern India. This is, these are two, Faridabad, which is now basically a part of Delhi, and Gandhidam, which is not. Um, and Faridabad is particularly interesting because it was, it was developed and built around, the, well, it was developed and built around the refugees, but the refugees took an active role in building the city. Um, yeah, so this is from his New Towns in India article. He's talking about the involvement of the refugees in the building of the city. He says most of the initial group of 20,000 refugees who built the beginnings of Faridabad Town, they were shopkeepers. They were an indifferent group of mostly middle-aged or, or elderly men and women who had been members of the privileged middle class and thought themselves too good for manual labor. They refused almost unanimously to accept employment with contractors, but agreed to form themselves into small cooperative groups of earth workers, brick manufacturers, road workers, bricklayers, carpenters, etc. So, although, there was initial resistance from the refugees, which is quite understandable. 
by rethinking the ways that, that the work could be managed. Um, Königsberg was able to involve the refugees in building Faridabad, and indeed Faridabad was built by these refugees. I think something like 95% of the construction in Faridabad, at least in the early stage, obviously not now, but in the early stages, was built by the refugees themselves. And I don't think you can call it a participative planning strategy, um, but it's moving in that direction. It's like listening to what the people who are going to be living there want and, and uh, need, and then trying to organize the planning around that. Yeah, and this is his network in 1951. Again, you can see here Fumi Baba, very big, and um, And here, this is a group that's like the government of India. Um, and then you also see figures who were also employed by the government of India, like Jane Drew and Maxwell Fly, who were involved in the Chandigarh plan, the Paul Busey is there too. Königsberger, as the director of housing, was somewhat responsible for the other big town planning projects that were happening, so he was tangentially involved with Chandigarh. Um, and then at the bottom, you have figures like Robert Gardner Bateman and Anthony um, Kayman, who were part of the first UN housing mission to um, Asia, where they were looking at low cost housing solutions um, for the United Nations. And they visited the housing factory and met Königsberger, so he began moving in these more international circuits. Yeah, so yeah, so you can see like from where he started to where he was when he when he ended his career in India. Um, yeah, it was quite a shift from more small scale architecture projects to very large scale urban um, development projects. Yeah, so in 1951, as a naturalized Indian citizen, Königsberger returned to Europe where his exilic experience put him in a unique and powerful mm -hmm. position. His deep understanding of architecture and planning in India set him apart from his so-called tropical expert contemporaries, such as Brian Drew, who had worked in the former colonies as agents of empire and were, as the empires crumbled, following a neo-colonial agenda. Königsberger dedicated the rest of his career to improving the standard of living in developing countries, and after years of Western colonization and domination, as he articulated it, restoring the balance of power. And during the rest of his career from his base in London at the Architectural Association, he continued to develop these ideas that had taken root when he was in India. So this elastic planning idea became action planning, which was then formalized and used in, in different contexts around the world, which was really taking the emphasis of the static nature of the, of the master plan and developing ways of making the whole planning um, process more dynamic with a series of different feedback loops so that people would be, in, would be kept up to date with what was actually happening on the ground as the, as the urban development progressed. And probably his most well-known contribution, I don't know if this is still a in your library or on the reading list, I don't know. But it was um, the Manual of Tropical Housing and Building, Part 1, Climatic Design. There was never a part two, unfortunately. Um, and yeah, that was published, I think, in 1972 or 1974. Um, and it was based on it was based on Königsberger's own research and findings, but as he was the the um, director of the School of Tropical Architecture at the Architectural Association in London, and then later at the Development Planning Unit at the Bartlett. He worked with a lot of students, and the students often came from abroad, from different countries, and then they would go back to where they'd come from and try and put these ideas that they'd been working with into practice, and they would refine them and send Königsberger and his colleagues refined ideas and different proposals and all of this kind of made its way into this book. So it's not so much a book by Königsberger, it's a book by Königsberger, Ingersoll, Mayhew and Solak, so call it, 
but it's also a book by the graduates of the tropical school. And it was published in uh, <clears throat> many different languages. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, so that's the end. But yeah, so I think what he learned in India was basically um, I mean, that, that a profound understanding of local building um, culture, understanding how spaces are used socially, as well as understanding the, the reasons be behind why um, building forms and articulations are the way they are. And then taking these and, and trying to understand it in a more scientific way, um, and the same with urban planning, like looking at how people organize themselves socially and culturally, um, and how urban development takes place in India in various locations. And then this all became part of, of his, basically of his formative, it was his formative practice, because he hadn't practiced very much in Germany before he left. And yeah, and this became the basis of what was a career that was spent working from London then, um, but advising governments around the world as well as um, working with agencies like the United Nations. Um, yeah, so thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, I think I, I, I managed to locate uh, maybe 90% of them. Some of them, there's basically no record. There's a mention of a building or there's a photograph, and, and a, a, but I don't know what the building is, and you can't tell what the building is just by looking at the photograph. And you don't have any idea of the location either. So there's a few left in his archive where it's like, oh, I've tried. <laughs> I, can't, I can't find it. And, and it may then, have been demolished long ago. And there is an there, there's an archive of photographs of his books. Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's an archive in London um, okay. at the Architectural Association, which contains his photographs, but in a very disordered manner. <laughs> it's not like they're all organized into one portfolio. They're not. He was not the best archivist, which also comes from being an exiled architect, I mean, there's a limit to what you can take with you when you go on a ship and what you can take back when you go on a plane. So, and photography in those days was very expensive. So he didn't take many photographs either. Yeah. Yeah, much more intelligent ways of air conditioning. 
Yeah, so yeah, so maybe they wouldn't, uh, yeah. It's, it's important to think about these things today. And not to think that we are reinventing the wheel when we come up with ideas about climatic control in buildings that don't um, rely on mechanical means. I mean, people have been working on this for a long time, so it's sometimes useful to go and look at what was happening, for example, in the 1940s, yeah, just to see what precedent there is. Drawings are so fragile 
and now they're I don't know, 70, 80 years old, so they're in a bad state. 